Animation performance is a big area of focus, and it has been for a while. So we've been actually working on animation performance for several years and uh, kind of iterated on this, and we've kind of built the foundation for the work that we did in 2019 over multiple releases. So we'll get into a little bit about kind of the history of all this, and this is particularly where we kind of want to talk about the evolution of things. So we started this work in Maya 2016, and Prior to Maya 2016, Maya was a single-threaded app, which meant that you could load up a scene, push play, and if you opened up your resource manager and you looked at the cores on your machine, one or two of those cores would be pegged out, and the other seven or 15 or however many you had would just be idle. They wouldn't be doing anything. That's because Maya was single-threaded, and it didn't even know about or didn't even understand how to use those additional cores. So starting in Maya 2016, we parallelized Maya. We created something called the Evaluation Manager, which provided or supported or allowed for, rather, multi-threading. Uh, and we also created something called the Performance Profiler, which was a diagnostics tool, which I'll get into in a second. But basically, what we had to do is, for we, I say we in the royal sense, the, the smart developers at, at Autodesk on the Maya team, uh, came up with a really clever way of kind of transparently converting what was a non-parallel friendly into something that is parallel friendly. So we have something in Maya called the dependency graph, which is basically the nodes and connections that make up your objects and your, your things like character rigs in Maya. And the dependency graph is basically the guts of Maya, and we couldn't really just rip that out and replace it with something else because Maya has been around for 20 years, and uh, people have built tools and pipelines around the dependency graph. It's very strong uh, and powerful for what it does, so we couldn't really take it away. So what the developers had to do is figure out a way to convert that into something that was parallel friendly because the dependency graph by, by nature is not parallel friendly. So they came up with this, this very transparent way of converting that into something called the forward evaluation graph. Uh, once that gets converted, which is almost instantaneous, not quite, but, but close to it, then there's something called the scheduler, which can look at that graph and it can basically pull parts and pieces of that graph out and offload them to different resources. So it can take different parts of the graph and it can offload those onto different cores, different CPUs, but it can also work with these things called evaluators to essentially offload very specific parts of the graph to things that are optimized for dealing with those things. So for instance, there is something called the GPU evalu evaluator, which allows you to offload things like deformation chains, where you can offload skinning and blend shapes and delta mush deformers and uh, other types of deformation. Uh, there's something called an invisibility evaluator, which basically deals with invisible objects and figures out what needs to be evaluated and what doesn't based on its invisibility state. The HIK evaluator takes the HIK rig, which is basically a, a full body IK rig, which, which was ported from Motion Builder to Maya. Uh, there's a separate evaluator that deals with that specifically. There's a separate evaluator that deals with dynamics. Dynamics are now supported uh, for parallelization. And you can also write custom evaluators, so you can use an API to generate your own custom evaluators if you have your own custom solvers that you want to be able to parallelize. So that's about as low level as I'm gonna get with this. This is kind of a, a very simple representation of the architecture for, uh, for Parallel Maya. Uh, we also created a performance profiler, which works very much with Parallel Maya, but it works with Maya in general. It can work at the dependence graph level as well. And what it does is it allows you to diagnose your scene. So I've got a character here that's running at about a frame, maybe a frame and a half per second. It's very, very slow. It's meant to be 30 frames per second. It's not, not even close. So here I can run the performance profiler and I can essentially get a snapshot in time or over time of the evaluation of all the nodes in my scene. So you can see the green section here is evaluation. And if I dive into this, I've got a representation of all the nodes in my scenes relative to time. You can see some of these are very small, which means they take almost no time to calculate, whereas I've got these others that are really, really wide, really wide meaning that they take up a lot of time. I can select those from the performance profiler. I can dive into my node editor in Maya. I can see what they do, and I can see if I can maybe remove those from the scene and or rebuild them in a way that makes them uh, more performant. So here I've actually taken that node out. It was doing a live transfer of UVs, which is not very smart. I remove that from my rig so that it's not going to transfer UVs every frame, and now I'm getting a much faster uh, playback. And you can see now, I, don't, I no longer have those really wide bars uh, being evaluated. You can also switch this into parallel mode. So I've turned on parallel Maya, basically. 
And now I can go in and switch into a threaded view. So if I rerun this evaluation, if I rerun this with the profiler, you can see now I get a representation of all the threads on my machine and I can see how the nodes are being distributed amongst all those threads. Now it's very hard to read here because of the size, but each one of those horizontal bars represents a, a core a thread and each one of those little colored dots represents a node that's being evaluated on one of those threads. And what you're aiming for is, is the most evenly distributed kind of layout of these nodes across as many threads as possible. And that's what I have here. So I can visually see that parallel, parallelization is actually happening and I'm not getting any huge bottlenecks. So there's a lot more to this than that. The parallel, uh, rather the performance profiler is a kind of a technical director, technical artist tool. Uh, it's very powerful and very useful for going in and, and breaking down your scenes and, and optimizing your scenes. So we'll get more into that in a bit, but I wanna move on to the evolution story and talk a little bit about uh, where we went from here. So in 2016, Maya 2016, we parallelized Maya. We introduced the evaluation manager and multi-threading. And we introduced GPU acceleration, but we didn't really fully support it. So we kind of supported it, but not really. So that was really what the initiative was with 2016, rather 2017 and 2018 were all about. It was about taking better advantage of the GPUs. So we started out by taking advantage of our CPUs and all of our cores. Next, we moved on to GPUs and taking advantage of GPU acceleration. So we added a number of deformers, but we did this over a series of releases. So if you take a look, what you can see is we started out with a very basic set of, of accelerated, GPU accelerated deformers, skin clusters, blend shapes, and the basics. And then over multiple releases, we ported more and more of these deformers or, or kind of rewrote these deformers to be GPU friendly. So we added things like nonlinear deformers, things like soft modification and delta mush, lattice, wire, and so on with every kind of update to Maya, culminating in Maya 2019 and the wire deformer, which uh, is a good example of what you can achieve with GPU acceleration. So here's a wire deformer that's deforming almost 2 million polys. Doesn't look like it, but that's 2 million polys. And just a straight up comparison with GPU acceleration to without, I'm seeing essentially a tenfold performance improvement. So there's another example of a deforming wave. I've got a wire deformer layered on top of this, running at 10 frames per second, 11 with, without GPU acceleration, running at 120 frames per second with GPU acceleration. So that uh, applies to all of our deformers. Now, some are more performant than others, but uh, just about all of our deformers, with the exception of a couple, RAP is one that's currently not being uh, GPU accelerated, but that's something that we're, we're investigating. So stay tuned on that. This all culminates in my 2019. So again, the phase here is starting to leverage all of our CPUs, moving on to leveraging GPU uh, as much as possible, and then culminating in leveraging all of our RAM. So we're trying to take advantage of all the hardware that we have at our disposal. And when I say RAM, I mean not only system RAM, but also graphics RAM, uh, VRAM. So this is uh, where playback cache comes in. You may have heard of playback cache at this point, is kind of the main Pre the feature, the core feature for Maya 2019. Um, and it was a, a lot of work to get to this point. There's a lot of uh, really smart people, a lot of really smart developers that came up with some really, really clever ways of dealing with this. But it's essentially a transparent background cache that will kind of pre-evaluate all of your animation for you, store it in cache, and then allow you to pull from that cache instantaneously or almost instantaneously uh, in, in essentially real time and play that back uh, as fast as possible. So here's just a, one example of some of the results we're seeing. Going back to legacy Maya, we'll call it, pre-parallelized, pre-GPU accelerated Maya, was, this scene was running at five frames per second. When we added parallelization and GPU acceleration, we got the scene up to 18 frames per second. And then by uh, taking it to the next step with cache playback, we got the same scene up to 45 frames per second. So that's a 10 times or a thousand percent, however you want to look at it, performance improvement, significant. So what we're trying to accomplish here is, is solving the problem of kind of quality versus performance. Now, historically, animators have always had to make trade-offs between quality and performance. So the ultimate goal, kind of the holy grail, is to have the highest possible quality, the highest fidelity representation of your scene in, in real time. That's the ultimate goal. So we want the works and we want it to be as fast as possible. 
But because of performance bottlenecks, historically people have had to make choices. Do you remove the lighting, make it a little bit faster? Do you remove the materials, which will make it faster? Do you reduce the number of characters that you're working with? Obviously that will make it faster. Or maybe you just remove your environments altogether to streamline the scene. And then ultimately what people will resort to is proxy characters. They will basically simplify the characters as much as possible with cut, cut up pieces of static geometry and removing any parts of, uh, any detailed parts of the, the meshes um, so that they can get the fastest playback possible. And so you have to make these choices along the way, but each time you do, you're losing fidelity in your scene and it makes it that much harder to really truly visualize what you're animating and, and kind of uh, see the full potential of, of what you're animating. The ultimate goal is to minimize the need for all of these various hoops that you have to jump, jump through in order to improve performance. So here's another example. Uh, this is something we were showing at GDC. It's a, it's a fully lit, fully textured scene with six characters. We have a dense motion capture on these rigs um, over, again, six characters, but we're also, we're also seeing no, normal maps and, and other types of texture maps. We're also seeing real-time shadows. We're also seeing real-time displacement on the ground. We're seeing a lot of bells and whistles. And running in Legacy Maya, this frame barely chugs along at 1.5 frames per second. As we start to add all of these different performance improvements, parallelization, for instance, we'll get it up to 14 frames per second. And then using, using various forms of caching, we can get this anywhere between 20 and 60 frames per second, even, even greater than 60 frames per second, all from a scene that started out at, at just over one frame per second. So we're seeing essentially uh, you know, 50-fold performance improvement in this case. That's, that's really, really significant improvement. Just to give you some kind of real life, kind of anecdotal evidence, uh, we co-presented some sessions at GDC with Santa Monica, Sony Santa Monica Studios, which is the studio that developed God of War. Uh, they uh, set, joined us on stage and talked about how they were using this. Uh, and this is just a, a quote from one of, one of their, I believe it was a technical director or technical lead. I tested cache playback on our Kratos rig. I get 135 frames per second when it's cached on a six core i7 GeForce 970. That's pretty incredible. Also anecdotally, they had a cinematics test scene that had multiple characters that was running at a frame per second. And they were able to get that up to 35 frames per second. That's a huge performance boost. So this is how it works. So I've kind of talked about kind of the, the way we got here. And now I want to talk a little bit about how this actually works. If you haven't used this yet, this kind of gives you an idea of what you can achieve. So this is a scene running. Let me just rewind that just so you can see it from the beginning. This is a scene running at eight frames per second in my 2018. I load that exact same scene up in 2019 with cash playback and I'm getting 24 frames per second. So in this example, I'm getting 300% performance improvement. Results will vary with hardware, with scene complexity, and so on. Now in 2018, in order to get real-time playback of this scene to reach the target frame rate, I would have to do a play blast, which would require me to render out every frame as an image. So I'd get an image sequence, and then that becomes uh, essentially uneditable. So with cache playback, the idea is that we can cache this as data and then put that up on the viewport, and then we can actually see it from any perspective. Once this is cached, we can tumble around the camera, we can change cameras, we can switch different modes directly from the timeline. So we just right click on the timeline and we can enable cache, we can set our different modes, we can bring up preferences which allow, which allow us to set things like the, the visual look of the cache, uh, also set things like the amount of memory that we're using. And the way that it works is as soon as you open the Maya scene, assuming it's enabled, it will start evaluating. That blue bar that you see represents the evaluation of the cache. And it evaluates from the frame that you're on. And it will evaluate in forward and backward in time. So it can evaluate pre and post frame. And it's all transparent. So once the evaluation is done, it immediately pulls from the cache for playback and for, for scrubbing. And then if you make changes to your character, your animation, they are the changes that you make are proportional or rather the updates to the cache are proportional to the changes. So here I'm editing the head, and it's only updating the frames that are affected by the change for that head. So it's not going to have to recache everything in your scene for every object in your scene. It's only going to have to recache the changes that are relative to that object that are affected only by the frame range of those changes. So again, it's pretty transparent for the animator. You do have to turn it on and off, but as far as what's happening and how it's working, it's, it's more or less transparent, allowing the animator to just kind of interact with the scene in the way that they always would uh, while using the cache. 
So what this leads us to, uh, and this is where we're getting in, in, into kind of a technology preview. This is not in Maya 2019, but this is something that our developers are investigating. One of the most common requests, I mentioned generally, the most common requests that we get from everybody is to make Maya faster. Make Maya faster, we make it faster, and they want it faster again, like I said at the beginning. From a functionality kind of feature standpoint, one of the most common requests we get around animation is around onion skinning and ghosting. Now, we've never really been able to achieve this in the past because it's very expensive. So we've been able to ghost very simple things like objects, but we've never really been able to ghost deforming characters because there's a lot of evaluation that goes on for every single frame that you want to ghost. So if you have an onion skin set up and you have like seven layers of that skin, in order to play that, in order to interact with that or scrub that, you have to evaluate all seven instances of time. You not only have to evaluate the frame you're on, but you have to evaluate three frames in the future and three frames in the past. So that is a huge performance hit, and it's why we've never really been able to achieve it in Maya up until now. Now, because we have cache playback, all of that evaluation is already done. So when we create a cache, or when a cache gets created for us, uh, kind of in the background, it's caching out all of those future and all of those past frames. We just have to pull from them. So once that cache is created, it's just a matter of grabbing that data from the cache and throwing it up on the viewport and visually representing it. So the guts of this is there with cache playback. The architecture exists. We just have to create the functionality that allows us to display these ghosts of this onion skinning in the viewport. And again, this is just kind of a work in progress. So um, this is something we uh, showed at GEC as kind of a preview. Let's get into a little bit more about how this works, just kind of at a lower level, but I'm gonna keep it fairly basic. In Maya, when you push play, two things have to happen. One is it has to evaluate all of the objects in your scene, and then it has to render those objects in the viewport, it has to draw them in the viewport. And when I say evaluate, there's a lot that goes on there. It has to evaluate things like animation curves. It has to evaluate things like IK solvers. It has to evaluate things like constraints and things like set-driven key. It has to evaluate uh, things like solvers, it, uh, different types of solvers. Um, all that has to be calculated, essentially, before it can be displayed on the screen. And the way Maya's worked in the past is that had to happen every single frame. When you refresh the frame, that evaluation had to happen every time you refresh the frame. It was evaluated, put into memory, pulled from memory, and put up on the, on the display uh, in the viewport. So now what we're doing is we're pre-evaluating all of that in the background. So we're evaluating every single frame, storing the evaluation of all of the nodes, every single node in your scene. Like I said, everything that's going on in a rig from constraints to IK to different types of solvers, and putting that in memory. And then, when it's time to render that, we simply pull from memory the frame that we need and we display it on the screen in the viewport. So really what's happening here, it's not actually two steps, it's actually multiple steps. Um, so if we had to break this down a little bit further, not only are we evaluating what's in the scene, but we also have to translate that data into something that is render friendly. In other words, we do a basic evaluation, we calculate everything in the scene, but then that has to be converted into something that is essentially uh, render friendly. So we translate that data into a render friendly format, and then that data has to be uploaded to the graphics card. So once it's uploaded to the graphics card, then it's just a matter of displaying it on the screen. But there's several steps in between here that have to be dealt with. And that just happens to coincide with the different caching modes that we provide. So you may have noticed in the beginning of the presentation, or you may have you may have played around with this yourself, we have different caching modes. We have an evaluation cache, we have a software cache, and we have a hardware cache. So these correspond to all the different steps along the way. So the straight up evalu evaluation cache is a cache of all of the calculations that we've done that has not yet been translated into a render-friendly format. The software cache is not only calculated, but it's been transferred into this render-friendly format it just hasn't been uploaded to the GPU card, uh, GPU RAM yet. And then hardware cache is the, the whole shebang. It's basically the evaluation or calculation of all of your, your data, the conversion into a render-friendly format, and it's pre-uploaded onto the graphics card. So it is the most optimized, fastest version of the cache that you can get, assuming your hardware can handle it. The reason we provide these three different modes is 
dependent uh, is because it's dependent on your hardware. If you don't have a lot of graphics RAM and your graphics card is not that great, you may not want to do a hardware cache, a VP2 hardware cache. Uh, you may just want to do a simple evaluation cache and then leave the, the rest uh, for later. Um, or you may want to go all the way and just go ahead and convert everything to the most optimized format possible uh, because you've got a big bad graphics card with a lot of RAM, a lot of graphics RAM. So we provide these as options basically so that you can kind of choose the one that is best suited for your hardware configuration is essentially uh, what it boils down to. So again, these can be set, it's a little hard to see here, but these can be set from the preferences or they can be set directly from the animation controls or the timeline right below the timeline. Uh, this is where you set your uh, cache playback to be on and then you choose the type of cache that you wanna create. Now, these are just uh, out of the box modes. So what we're providing here are three out of the box modes that you can choose from but we provide an API that allows you to create your own custom modes. Now this is getting into kind of the weeds and it's to be honest, kind of beyond me as well. I'm not a developer, so I would never do this myself, but through the API, you can actually extend this functionality and you can create your own custom playback modes or your own custom cache playback modes. Uh, you can use this MPX cache config rule filter in order to create custom rules. Uh, and then there's an example of this in the dev kit, something called name filter that's in the dev kit. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, there is a great session that was done at GDC by Martin DeLassa, who's a senior development manager working on Maya. Incredibly smart guy. He kind of managed for a large, to a large extent the development of, of this whole system. Uh, and he did a talk at GDC. If you want to see this, he goes into a lot more detail than I'm able to go into about not only cache playback and the architecture of cache playback, but also uh, how to customize it. So if you go to the area and you go to the search section and you search for GDC 2019, find GDC 2019 and you'll see Autodesk Developer Days sessions. And these are all the sessions that we presented. I mentioned the one about God of War, that's in here too. But if you scroll down, you'll find the section that's called My 2019 Fast Animation. And if you scrub about 20 minutes into this, Martin DeLassa does a really, really great session that goes into a lot more detail than I am able to go to here in this webinar on uh, how to customize the cache playback. Another thing that you can do if you're interested is there are a couple of white papers that go into very, very low, low level detail about how this works. Now, as an animator, I know you probably don't care about any of this. As, a, as an average kind of typical artist, you probably don't care about any of this. Uh, and your eyes may roll over once you get into the weeds. But you probably work with technical people and you probably work with uh, a tech art team or technical directors or somebody that would be interested in this. So point them to this if they're not aware already. Uh, there are white papers for both Parallel Maya and Cache Playback and they're updated for Maya 2019. Uh, so for every version, we update these with new sections uh, and maybe based on new functionality. Uh, so there are two different white papers that go into pretty granular detail about how to customize these at a very, very low level. So again, that's about as far as I'm gonna go into it, but it's there if you need it. Another thing that you can point the more technically minded people to is something called the Evaluation Toolkit. This is not something I would recommend for animators, uh, but it's something I would recommend for TDs and tech artists. It's basically a toolkit that consolidates a bunch of different uh, tools for essentially streamlining and optimizing your scene uh, and also diagnosing problems in your scene. So I won't go into the weeds here other than to point out a few things. It's a collection of tools that allow you to essentially diagnose your scene and figure out where your performance bottlenecks are. Uh, you can do the high level stuff like setting your evaluation modes and enabling and disabling your evaluators, but you can also do a variety of types of debugging. So for instance, you can debug your scene and figure out if your deformers are, are working with the GPU. And if they're not working with the GPU, why aren't they working with the GPU? You can also get visual representations of your evaluation. So this graph on the right represents a section of the evaluation graph. Uh, you can view things like cycles and paths between nodes in a graphical way so that you can see how the, your scene is actually being evaluated. Again, don't want to go into too much more detail than that, but it's a, it's a great tool set for the more technically minded people out there. And we've made updates to this in Maya 2019. Um, if you go to the documentation section for Maya 2019, there are some new little bells and whistles that were added to the evaluation toolkit for uh, diagnosing scene bottlenecks and whatnot. 
So a few other things that were done on the animation front, uh, and this kind of ranges from my 2017 to 2019. Um, we GPU accelerated the graph editor. The graph editor used to run on the CPU, uh, so it wasn't very performant, particularly when you're dealing with really, really dense curve data like motion capture, for instance. Now it's GPU accelerated, so the graph editor itself runs on the GPU, so interaction with dense curve sets, dense curve data, is much faster than it was before now that it's GPU accelerated. We also added things like uh, a suspend option for the time editor. In 2019, we added the ability to turn off the refresh of the time editor. Uh, the time editor is our nonlinear animation tool so that you can group clips and organize clips without it constantly evaluating. So you can do really quick organizational stuff and then turn on the evaluation when you're done. And then some more specific things, uh, cluster performance has been improved, uh, invisibility performance has been optimized, the playback of, uh, of scenes with lots of invisible objects. Uh, HIK evaluation has been improved. Uh, HIK evaluation uh, in Parallel Maya is now up six times faster, which is pretty significant. So a lot of kind of smaller individual updates for animation performance along the way. 